Good morning. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Whether you're joining us in person or whether you're joining us online, we're going to enter into a time of worship right now to give God glory, honor, and praise. Amen. So when we sing about this joy that we have, it's not an external, situational-based joy, but it's the joy that comes from the Lord. Amen. So come on, let's join with all of our voices together, with all of heaven, as we sing out these worship songs. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. I know your thoughts 
Thank you. 
going to ask you this morning just to bow your head right where you are and perhaps you'd like to join me in just lifting your hands to God if you're comfortable doing that this morning. It's a way of offering our praise and thanks to Him and thanking Him for who He is. Lord, we come before you this morning. What a powerful name your name is. The name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are indeed Lord. We came to this place this morning, Lord, not just together with people. We came together unto you. You're the center of our attention, Jesus. Because you gave your life for us that in the midst of our sin and our brokenness, Lord, you came from heaven to earth and you came down and went to that cross and gave your life so that we could have light to forgive us of our sins, to offer us newness in you, to a brand new start. Lord, for that, we're so very grateful and thankful this morning. So, Lord, with hands lifted, with hearts open, we honor you and we praise you and we thank you. And we present to you every need in our life. Lord, some are in this place today and they're going through difficulties and challenges. Some are going through a a very dark and difficult trial in their life right now. But, Lord, we know that you're the rock upon which we stand. That when everything else crumbles around us, Lord, we know that you're the one that never fails us. You're the one that never gives up on us. You're the one that carries us through. You're the one that makes a way when there is no way. Father, I pray that there would come comfort and peace to every heart in life. I pray that healing would come upon your people today. Lord, I pray that you'd touch and heal bodies, heal minds, heal spirits, heal relationships. Do stuff that only you can do by your supernatural power. You're the omnipotent God. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is impossible with you, Lord. We worship you today. We honor you. We praise you. We thank you for your love to us. We thank you that you're here in this place right now. Lord, we sense, we know, and we understand by the promise you've given to us that you're here with us today. So we honor you as the one that we worship, the only one who is worthy of our worship. We praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. And all the church together said, Amen. Amen. Are you glad to be in church this morning? Good to see you. Boy, you're looking good today. And I'm sure that right now there's some wonderful people around you that love to say hi to you. So why don't you swing around, say hi to the people around you, then you can be seated. Welcome to church. Again, so glad to see everyone here today. If you're with us at Church of the Redeemer today for the very first time, we're especially glad to have you with us. I'm going to ask all of our regulars to give the warmest welcome you can to our newcomers today. Welcome to church. If you're with us for the first time today, here's what you want to do. Grab this little uh, bulletin you received on the way in, and if you'll get your phone out right now and scan the QR code right there. We have a gift for you. We also would love to connect with you, provide you some spiritual resources. You can get access to that by that QR code there. You can scan it now later on the service or even when you go home this afternoon. But let us know that you were here with us this weekend if you're here for the first time. And then at the end of today's service, we have a special meet and greet that happens that I'll tell you more about in just a little bit. Just a couple of announcements for all of us here today. Don't forget that as we're going through church life together, there are all kinds of things that happen in our church that we want you to be aware of. So you can stay with us, stay updated on all the different activities by going to church-redeemer.org slash info, church-redeemer.org slash info, or you can download our church app, the MyCORMYCOR app on your Apple Store or your Google Play Store, and keep that on your phone. It's a great place and a great way to stay up, not only with the activities of the church, but also some good resources that are available for you there as well. And then also just a reminder that if you want to know more about giving here at the church, how you can be a part of helping us accomplish the mission God's given us, uh, really simple to do that. You can go to the church website at church-redeemer.org slash give, or right on the back side of your bulletin, you'll see also a little QR code at the bottom for giving as well, if you'd like to be a part of it. Your giving helps us to accomplish our mission, uh, not only here, but literally around the world, all of our global partners that we're assisting uh, with missions around the world. A couple more announcements we have for you. They're going to be right on the screens. Let's watch this together. Welcome to church. We are so glad you're here. If you're visiting us for the first time, let us know by scanning the QR code on the bulletin you received when you walked in or by stopping by the meet and greet after service. We'd love to get to know you. We are so excited to tell you about the many opportunities for you to get connected here at Redeemer. Here are just a few. Have you ever considered going on a short-term mission trip? Join us as we bring the love and message of Jesus to the nations of Peru and Honduras this July and October. 
You'll have the chance to change lives for eternity and it will make an amazing impact on your life as well. The Peru Mission Trip registration deadline is this Wednesday. For more information and to register, visit churchjeshredeemer.org slash info. If you are looking for ways to get more connected at Redeemer, Living Stones is your best next step. Through this three session class, you'll learn about the history, vision, and mission of Church of the Redeemer. Starting Sunday, March 5th at our Frederick campus. For more information and to sign up, visit churchjeshredeemer.org slash info. Spending time with God every day is one of the most critical choices you can make to grow stronger. We have some resources to help you with this. First, sign up for the two minute daily devotional sent to you every weekday. Delivered straight to your phone, it's a video devotional from Pastor Dale. Just text DEVO to 240-269-2100. Second, Pastor Dale has written multiple devotional books. The popular series entitled Espresso for Your Spirit will help motivate and inspire you and help you understand and apply God's word to your unique challenges you're facing. To get your copy, visit church slash info or visit the Resource Center on your way out. Thank you for being with us this weekend. Make sure to follow us on social media at church underscore redeemer and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now let's get back to the rest of our service. Let's pray again together. Father, we ask in the next few moments as we study your word that you would speak to us today. Let your, let your word come into our hearts. Change us from the inside out today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me in welcoming our Frederick campus? Good morning to all the folks in Frederick this morning. Good to see you as well in church today. We're continuing a series of messages entitled Chosen. We've been talking about the importance of being the kind of person that positively attracts God's attention. How can you and I be the right kind of person, uh, the person that God would choose to use and choose to fellowship with, to be with in our lives? Now, in this series, we've been taking a look at the most important part of your life because the Bible says that the most important part of you is a part that no one else can see, and that is your heart. In fact, he tells us in his word that people look at the outward appearance, but God looks at your heart. And so when God inspects us, when God looks at us, he's not uh, paying attention to your hairdo or the clothes you're wearing or the car you're driving or the house that you live in. When God looks at you and me, he's looking on the inside of us. What's the condition of our heart? And in the scriptures, there one, there's one particular man that truly attracted the positive attention of God because of his heart. In fact, God had a unique testimony, a unique statement about this man. He said, this man is a man after my own heart. And this man's name was David. David in the Old Testament was the second king of Israel. The first king of Israel was a man by the name of Saul. And seeing King Saul had disobeyed God and had really rebelled against God. And because of that, God had removed his blessing from King Saul and said, I'm going to raise up a second king. And this king is going to be a man after my own heart. And that man was chosen from the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. And his name was David, a shepherd boy. He had the right kind of heart. The heart that God said, that's the kind of person that I choose. That's the kind of person that I can use. And what you and I have been doing in this series and the, together, hopefully you've been a part of it. Uh, we're on our seventh message in the series. If you've missed any of these, you can always go back to our website at church-redeemer.org and catch up with all the uh, former messages. But I'm on the seventh in uh, installation of this message. And we're going to talk today about another aspect of David's heart that caused God to say, that's the kind of person that I choose. That's the kind of person that I want. This is a person after my own heart. I want to talk to you today about one important word, and that is the word tenderness. Would you say that word with me? tenderness. David was chosen by God because he had a tender heart. We're going to unpack this a little bit today and try to understand what this means and how you and I can move further in our lives in terms of developing a tender heart before God and also before others as well. I'm going to share with you three things. The first thing is sort of foundational. I need to lay a foundation for understanding what we see in David's life and an important principle that you and I need to grasp. And then the last two points that I will make today will help us to understand how to actually develop this in our own lives together. How do we grow as tender people? But the first thing is to understand that a tender heart, according to God's word, according to scripture, a tender heart is really what a strong heart is all about. If you want a strong heart, you must have a tender heart. And that means we have to debunk some myths. 
we have to break down some myths, misconceptions. A lot of people think, you know, if you're tender, you're just soft. If you're tender, then you're not really a strong person at all. If you're weak in a negative sort of way, then obviously you're not going to have great strength in your life. And that idea really needs to be dispelled because it's really not what the scripture teaches at all. Let's take a look at David for a moment. David, although he was a very strong man, I'll come back to that in a bit, tremendously strong man, he's one of the most tender-hearted characters in all of the Bible. David was a poet. David was a songwriter. And when you read through his poetic writings, which are found in the book of Psalms, right in the middle of your Bible, 150 of uh, those Psalms recorded in Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, not all of them are Psalms of David. There's some Psalms from, uh, songs from others as well in there. But the majority of the songs, if you will, in the book of David, the psaltery are songs that David wrote, words, lyrics that he penned. And you see the tenderness, the tender part of David coming forth. He understood the tender side of life. and He understood the tender side of relationships. You see this over and over again. David vulnerably expressed his dependency upon God. Although he was a mighty warrior, he knew that his strength came from God. You see this in Psalm 59, verse 17. He says to God, you are my strength. I sing praise to you. You, God, are my fortress, my God on whom I can rely. You see that there are times that David, as he's writing these songs, he expresses his heartache and his distress, stuff he's going through in his life. Like Psalm 31, verse 9, where he writes, be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. There were times that David would even express his fear to God. Yes, David, this mighty warrior. There were times in his life when he too was afraid because he wrote words like this in Psalm 56 verse 3, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Not if I'm afraid, but when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. David was even willing to share the most vulnerable moments of his life in the midst of his guilt and shame because he recognized he'd done something wrong. He was willing to bring the tender, broken part of his life to God. It's expressed in Psalm 32, verses 4 and 5. Listen to his words. The pen of David tenderly communicating his need for mercy and grace from God. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. David expressed tender love to God. He has a soft heart, a tender heart. And he expresses it by communicating his tremendous love for God. As is found in Psalm chapter 18, verse 1. I love you, Lord, my strength. In all of these verses, do you see his vulnerability? Do you see his tenderness? Do you see the soft side of a mighty warrior? And indeed, David was a mighty warrior. But in the midst of this, he understood his limitations. He understood his inadequacies. And yet, at the same time, he was very strong. This was the man that withstood Goliath. He was the man that stood and had the slingshot and sent the stone that fell Goliath. He was the man that when everyone else was living in intimidation of Goliath, he stood up and said, I'm going to fight him. But nevertheless, he was a man who was very, very tender in heart. And I would submit to you today that David's tenderness of heart was the secret to his great strength. And I will tell you today that if you want to be strong, you've got to be weak. If you want to be strong, you have to be tender. And if you never bother to develop a tender heart, you're going to miss the essence of what strength is all about from God's perspective. Jesus said it this way. Jesus himself, our Savior, our Lord, our Master, Teacher, in the book of Matthew and what's called the Sermon on the Mount and that great portion of the Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes, he gives us these words in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. If you're taking notes this morning, I would encourage you to circle the word meek because that's a very important word. The Greek word is praus. And that word praus literally means to be gentle or to be tender. It was used to describe an animal, a wild animal that had been broken 
and brought into domestication and able to be used. Blessed are the meek, for they are the ones who will inherit the earth. And David understood this because David himself penned these words in Psalm 37, verse 11, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. So if you want to be strong, you have to be weak. If you want to be strong, you have to be tender. See, these are not contradictory to one another. They're not mutually exclusive. To be strong, you can't be weak. No, you can't be strong without being weak. Paul, the great apostle, think about the strength of this man. He was a man that withstood all kind of persecutions and all kind of torment from people, all kind of misunderstandings. He preached the gospel when no one wanted him to preach it and withstood crowds that were against him. And nevertheless, Paul writes these words as a strong man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. He says, I'm not going to boast about the things that show my strength. I'm going to boast about things that show my weakness. He unpacks this more in this next chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, as he is describing going through a time of great difficulty in his life and, he, and, and God's response to him where God told him these words, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect. God says, my power is made perfect. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul again says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. Read the last sentence with me together. And would you read it aloud and loudly? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Notice the when then. When I am weak, then I am strong. So strength of heart literally comes, according to God's perspective, comes from a tenderness of heart. A hard heart makes you weak. A tender heart makes you strong. Now, how do we develop this tender heart? What's required? What does it look like? What does this mean, tenderheartedness? Well, the second point today, and it helps to unpack this a little bit more in terms of understanding what a tender heart is. A tender heart really is a sensitive heart. That's what I'm talking about. It's actually what Scripture is talking about when we talk about a tender heart. It's a sensitive heart. Sensitivity is a heart quality, is it not? Have you ever tried to share your problem with someone who is not very sensitive? You're just pouring your guts out and you're just bleeding everywhere and they change the subject. Okay. It's like it goes completely over their head. They don't get it at all. They don't understand anything about what you say. They have no connection with you whatsoever. No compassion. No awareness. And you're like, my, they're so insensitive. Anybody ever said that about someone? Don't look at your partner now right now. <laughs> so insensitive. It's not just an action that people do. It's just something that comes from the heart. To be sensitive, you've got to have a heart. We talk about people having a heart. Have you ever shared your concerns or your needs or your pressures or your problems with someone who is sensitive? And they listen and they draw out and they help you to find healing and restoration internally because they are sensitive or responsive. They have a tenderness in the moment of your own tenderness and weakness. They're responsive to your vulnerability that when you're vulnerable, they know how to respond to your vulnerability. These are issues of a sensitive heart. And so to be a person after God's heart, you have to have a tender heart. To have a tender heart, you have to have a sensitive heart. Now, part of having a sensitive heart, this is where I want to get at the essence of today's message, is having a right conscience. Because a sensitive heart also includes a sensitive conscience. I want you to say the word conscience with me just for a moment. That's a key word because we understand we've heard the word, my conscience is bothering me. You've heard that before? Or, I'm not bothered by that in my conscience. We hear that word before, but we don't often think about what it means. But this is where I want to drill in a bit more today. Because if you're going to be sensitive to God and properly sensitive to others, you have to have a sensitive conscience. That's a part of being a sensitive person. That's part of being tender before God. To be tender before God means that you're sensitive in your heart or sensitive as a part of your heart in your, what's the word I gave you a moment ago? Your conscience, okay? So right here in the center of your being your conscience, and your conscience is an awareness of what is right and an awareness of what is wrong. 
If you have a soft conscience or a tender conscience, you are easily aware of and made aware of something that's right or wrong. If you have a hardened conscience, you're not so aware of things that are right and wrong. And so we all, our conscience as our heart, all has, it has a condition right now. You either have a soft conscience, responsive to God, or you have a hard conscience and you're not very responsive to God. You don't get it when it comes to what's right and what is wrong, or you push that away from your life. Now, David had a sensitive heart, a tender heart, a sensitive heart, and it's demonstrated in the fact that he had a very sensitive conscience. Let me give you an example of this in 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'm not going to read this passage for you. You can go home today and read it for yourself. I told you the story. I read it for you a few weeks ago. I'll recite it again for you today. Remember, Saul was the first king of Israel. God said, done with you. David's going to be the second king. And, but there was this overlapping period of time while Saul was still king and David had not yet arisen to the throne. He was on the way to becoming king, but he wasn't king yet. And during this period of time, Saul hates David. Saul wants to kill David. And so David's running around for his life, trying to hide from Saul because Saul wants to kill him out of jealousy. And so David's running around in the southern part of Israel called the Judean wilderness. And he's hiding from Saul and trying to make sure he's protected from this, this evil king that is jealous, wanting to destroy him. And one day as David is down in, these Judean, in the Judean wilderness and he realizes that Saul is coming after him, he and some of his men go and hide in a cave, in the very back part of a cave to be protected from Saul so that they would, he would not know they were, that they were there. But as things would happen, Saul just ends up in the same cave where David is. But Saul didn't know that David was hiding in the back of the cave. Okay, And David's men said, David, here's your chance. Okay, Saul is in here. He doesn't know that you're here. And so you can end this thing now. Get your knife. Go in behind him. Kill him. And it'll all be over with. You can solve the problem right now. All you need to do is commit murder. Everybody say wrong. Okay. All you need to do is kill him, okay? And so David says, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe God's talking to me. It's like, I need money. Maybe I should rob a bank. Oh, thank you, God. Okay. No, we know that's wrong. But the point being is that David was tempted in this moment, and so he sneaks in and comes in behind where Saul is. Saul still doesn't know he's there. He has the knife in his hand, but somehow he stops before he murders him and cuts off a portion of the royal robe. And the Bible says that as soon as he cut off a portion of the royal robe, his conscience struck him. Read it in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And he realized, oh, why did I do that? Have you ever been there in your life? Amen. You ever had the why did I do that moment? Okay. Have you ever had that moment in your life? Come on. Amen. Why did I do that? Okay. That was stupid. And just so you, you know today, every one of us here today are about a second away from stupid. Okay. <laughs> Some of us are half a second away from stupid. <laughs> Some of us have already proven we're stupid, okay? <laughs> right? So David said, that was stupid. I sh God forbid that I should touch God's anointed. And he was conscience stricken and he made it right with Saul. But that's what I want you to see. See, in that moment, even when he did something wrong, he was made aware of the fact that he'd done something wrong. Why? Because he had a good working heart, a good working heart conscience. He had a tender conscience before God. And so he repented of that. In all of our lives, it is extremely important that you and I have the right, the right kind of conscience. David understood this conscience as well, because we see very clearly at another point in time of great failure in his life. And most of you will know this, this moment in David's life. Do you remember a lady by the name of Bathsheba? 
There was a moment that David goes up on the roof. It's nighttime and he looks out upon, his, upon uh, his, his, the city of David and he sees this woman that's bathing and he's, he has lust in his heart and he results in, a, in an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. And now he knows he's got to deal with it because she's pregnant and he doesn't know what to do in the situation. And so her husband is in the army. He's serving at a distance for, for, David's, uh, for David's, and David's as, as a soldier of David. And so David arranges now, not only in the committing of the sin with Bathsheba, but arranges for Uriah, her husband, to be killed in battle. He didn't kill her, kill him himself, but he arranged the circumstances so the guy would be killed. Wrong. But even after doing something wrong, there's a, even though there was a moment of hardness because he fell into temptation, he came back to softness in his heart because he ultimately penned these words that you find in Psalm chapter 51. I want you to notice the tenderness of David's heart after he had committed this sin. This is the prayer that he prayed after he realized how terrible he had acted and what he had done. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Go down with me to verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Even though he had failed, he came back to God in repentance because he had a soft heart. And this is the major difference between Saul and David. Both of them failed. Both of them sinned against God. Saul remained hardened. He never repented. David was soft and repented before God. And the difference in your life is whether you have a hardened conscience or a soft conscience. Because all of us are going to fail along the journey of life. Amen? There's not a single person sitting in this room that will live your life perfectly. There's not a single person in this room or listening to my voice or watching with us there in, in Frederick that will not at some point in time have a, oh my, that was stupid moment. Amen. Every one of us have those moments in life. And the difference as to whether you will come back stronger or never make it to where you need to make it in your relationship with God will all depend upon what happens with your conscience. Not only after you fail, but your conscience can also keep you from failing. Okay, It can be a guide in your life that warns you before you step into the trap. So my question is, how tender is your conscience? Do you have a working conscience? Does your conscience work very well? Is your conscience properly programmed? Are you responding to your conscience? I created a little graphic for us that you'll see on the screen. This might be the most important graphic. I'll give you the whole year. Take a look at this graphic. God's Word and God's Spirit is the source of our truth, right? How do we know what's true? How do we know what's right and wrong? Oh, I, whatever's right to me is right. That's what the world tells you. The world tells you whatever feels good to you, just do it. Because it's really about what you feel is right. Whatever's right to you is right. No, it's not, that's not accurate. Whatever is right is what God says is right. Because God created us and God gives us an order, a structure, standards to live by. That's why when he brought his children out, into the, out of the Egyptian bondage into the wilderness, preparing them for the promised land, he took them to Mount Sinai and gave them the law, the Ten Commandments. He said, this is right and this is wrong. This is how you're supposed to live. And so God gives us standards to live by. He instructs us to, in regard to what's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. And also by his spirit, he helps us to understand what truth is because the the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. And so we need objective standards for our life in terms of right and wrong. By the way, the world is rejecting objective standards. Okay. But God says, no, I have some absolute rights and some absolute wrongs. And so we need, to, we need to have our conscience programmed by God's Word and by God's Spirit. Because only when your, your conscience is programmed by God's Word and God's Spirit will you even know what's right and wrong. You can't choose what's right and wrong just on your own. You need God's Word to tell you and God's Spirit to work His truth into your conscience. Now, when God's Word and God's truth and God's Spirit works in, in your life, your conscience can do one of two things with it. 
It can either reject it. Notice on the left-hand side, what's that word there? Hard. On the right-hand side is soft. It's very simple, okay? But this is a vital little diagram. So God's word, God, God's conscience comes to you. You can become hardened by it and say, I don't want that in my life. I'm not going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do with my life. I don't need God in my life. I don't even believe that stuff. And so we can push God away. We can, we can be ignorant of his truth. We can ignore his truth. We can be resistant to his truth. And when we do that, when we harden our conscience and reject and push God away, what is the end result? The bottom word on the left-hand side, what is it? Judgment. Now, God's not up in heaven, heaven looking to judge you. God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. And so people, well, why does God judge people? God's not about judging people. He is the judge and will judge. And there's coming a day of judgment. But you and I judge ourselves by the choices we make in our lives. Amen. It's not about God sending someone to hell or God rejecting someone. We make choices in our life to harden ourselves against God, which results in judgment. God says, if you don't want anything to do with me on earth, I suppose you don't want anything to do with me for eternity. I have to take the choice. If you don't want anything to do with me while you're down here, I've just got to assume the fact that you don't want anything to do with me for eternity. And so that's your choice, okay? So that's why, that's why this life is so important because in this life, you're choosing for the next life. Amen. And by the way, yeah. And by the way, listen to me. Don't be fooled. This life is like this. Amen. Okay? Oh, it's not even that, Okay. Go to the grave, grave, graveyard, go to the cemetery. You're going to see birth, death, birth, death, and a dash in between. Okay, a little dash in between. Okay, born, died, that's my life, dash. Okay, but eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. And so people who choose to harden their conscience against God and they're not willing to receive truth in their life, that's the path they've chosen for their life. On the other side, you can choose that when God's word comes to you and you realize what God says is right and wrong, you say, okay, I'm going to respond to that. That's being soft, okay? That's softening your heart to God. I'm going to do what God asks me to do. And then when you violate God's word and God's spirit, what are you going to feel in the light green section? What are you going to feel? What? That's what guilt is. Guilt is when you violated True guilt is when you violated one of God's rules, one of God's principles. And when you feel guilty, our, your response, our response needs to be to be convicted about it. Hey, this is something I don't want in my life. To feel sorry for it. It's called contrition. I don't want to continue in this pathway. And then actual repentance where we say I'm turning away from this and getting back in right relationship with God. This is exactly what David did. That when David sinned against God, he felt the guilt... And then out of that guilt, he was convicted of the fact that he was a sinner before God, and he had contrition, godly sorrow. Boy, I'm sorry I did this. And then from that came repentance, where he turns back to God. Repentance just simply means, this is, I'll show you repentance. You ready for it? 180. Turning around. I'm going this way, and I repent, now I'm going this way. Okay. So when we're walking away from God and we repent, what do we do? We turn toward God and now begin to give and live in relationship with him. That's what repentance is. And what does that lead to ultimately? What's the last section on that right-hand side? Mercy and grace. Let me ask you, which do you prefer? Do you want judgment that you set down the path and just want to be hard? I don't need God in my life. I don't want, to, I don't want him telling me what to do. Okay. And you set yourself on the pathway to that judgment. Or do you want to say, you know, I want a soft conscience. If God says it's right, it's right. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care what the world says. It doesn't matter what the world says. Because the world is passing away. Do you understand that? Okay. It doesn't matter what the world says is right and wrong. What matters is what God says is right and wrong. That's what matters. Okay. And so I'm going to make a choice based upon what God says is right and wrong because I know where that leads to. It leads to mercy and it leads to grace in my life. That's a very important, very significant little flow chart for you. Everybody has a conscience. I need to go through this very quickly because I want to get to my last point in just a moment. I'm not going to take time to read these passages for you, but you can read them for yourself. They'll be in the, in, in the more extended notes that you find on our website. But everybody has a conscience. 
The question is, how is your conscience programmed? Are you responsive to God or not responsive to God? And I'll say this last thing before I go to my final point. True guilt is a good thing. Let me let that sit there for a moment. Because our world says, oh, don't ever feel guilty. Don't ever feel guilty about anything. You should never feel guilty. No, there are times you should feel guilty. Okay. Okay. True guilt, when you violated God's word and you feel it, don't push it away. Respond to it. Because true guilt is a good thing. Now, false guilt, if you're feeling guilty for something you shouldn't feel guilty about in terms of God didn't say anything about that, but you're now feeling guilty, or, or you're still feeling guilty over a sin you've confessed and God's forgiven you for. There's no reason for you to continue to beat yourself up over something that God's forgiven you for. You need to forgive yourself, right? So that's false guilt. So there's a difference between true guilt and false guilt. But true guilt is a good thing. True guilt is what prompts us. It's like a warning on the dashboard of your car. Okay, It's like that little frustrating check engine light that comes on. And we want to just keep driving for the next 20,000 miles and ignore it, okay? So I don't care about that. It means nothing, okay? What does it mean? Oh, it doesn't mean anything. Well, actually, it might mean something, okay? And the same is true for guilt in your life. It's the check engine, little light that shines and blinks at you and says, warning, warning, warning. And a soft conscience responds to it. Here's my last point, okay? Everybody good so far? A tender heart is a sensitive heart, but it's also a forgiven and a forgiving heart. I want to walk through this fairly quickly, so put your seatbelts on. We're going fast here, okay? Nothing softens a person's heart more than forgiveness. Receiving forgiveness, giving forgiveness. David's heart was tenderized by the gracious love that God had shown to him in his failures. Let me prove this to you. When... Someone responds or treats you with love, how do you tend to respond back? With tender, you open your heart to people who love you, correct? If someone treats you with hate or disrespect, what do you do with your heart? You You create hardness, right? You're with me on that? Okay. And so love creates openness and responsiveness and tenderness. And hatred creates walls. That's why marriages have problems. So much hatred in a marriage being spread back and forth. People just close off to each other. Put walls up in their life. They become hard in the relationship. Why? Because you hurt me. And I'm not going to let you hurt me anymore. Because I don't trust you. I don't trust your words. I don't trust what you're having to say. You're, You're diminishing my life. You're disrespecting me. And so we put these walls up. And we become hard on the inside in the relationship. Now on the other hand, if someone is loving toward us, we break the walls down. We become more vulnerable in the midst of vulnerability. So vulnerability creates vulnerability. Hatred or hardness creates hardness. David, in the midst of his most difficult moments, his greatest failures, he learned that he could go to God even when he'd messed up and he would still find love. That God did not stop loving him even when he messed up. And so he trusted God enough to bring his vulnerabilities, to bring his weaknesses to God. Take a look with me at what David writes in Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is, he's learned this about God. We talked about it last weekend. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. This is what he learned about God. He will, all, he will not always accuse, nor will he har- harbor his anger forever. For he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Anybody say hallelujah right there, okay? Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. See, David understood the tenderness of God toward him and the love of God toward him. And because of that, he was able to love God and return with a tender heart. Jesus taught us this. Amen. In Luke chapter 7, there's an amazing story that Jesus gives us. Let me unpack this final story with us. Actually, this story in one final verse. One of the Pharisees, Pharisees, religious guy, they thought they had it all together when Jesus was, was in ministry on the earth. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. He went to the, to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So the Pharisee said, hey, Jesus is going to have dinner with me. Jesus goes and uh, sits down at the table. 
A woman in that town who lived a sinful life. What kind of life did she live? Simple life. Very important statement. Learned, this lady learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. So she's weeping. Weeping is a sign of tenderness. Let me just say this as a side note here, sidebar. If you can't weep, generally you're hard, okay? Not always the case, but hardness is often symptomized by the fact that there are no tears that will ever come from your life. So she's tenderized, she's soft, she's weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the, Pharisees who had, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know she, who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Everybody say hard. There you go. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. So 550. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Simon's the Pharisee. The woman is the sinful person that's coming to Jesus for forgiveness. He turned toward the woman and said to Simon, the Pharisee, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Tenderness. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered does not stop kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head. But she's poured perfume on my feet. By the way, that perfume represented something very expensive to this lady. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, what? Loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Let's understand this for a moment. Got to get this, this story. Pharisee, hard man, judging this lady who comes in. Jesus uses a story. If two people, one had a great debt, one had a little debt, both are forgiven. Who's going to love more? Well, the one with the bigger debt, obviously. And Jesus was trying to make a point to Simon. This lady loves me because she understands how much I've forgiven her. You don't love me because you don't understand how much you need to be forgiven. You don't understand how many things in your life are just as bad as the things are in her life. Amen. And until you recognize that you're just as much of a sinner as she is, you're never going to love me like she loves me. Amen. See, it's true in our lives that we so often we want to point our fingers at somebody else. We're sitting in the service thinking, boy, I sure wish so-and-so was here. They need to hear this. <laughs> I sure hope my wife's listening. My husband's listening. They sure need to hear this. But as the old song says, it's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Amen. And Jesus said, you don't understand. You don't get it. If you would know how, how needful forgiveness is in your own life, like she does, you could love me like she loves me. You could be tender in the way she is tender. And here's the final thing I'll say today. Having been in the tender environment of God's grace and forgiveness, anybody today thankful that God has treated you in a way, not, in, has not treated you in a way that your sins deserve. He's treated you in a way that goes beyond what you deserve. Okay? That's grace. Okay. We talked about that last week. It's, you can't separate tenderness from grace. They go together, okay? Graciousness and tenderness are like twin complementing qualities. And then having received that, we're called to give it to other people. Last verse, I promised you this. Here it is. Actually, two verses. First Peter chapter 3. With this, we're done. Peter writes these words to the church of his time and to us as well. Inspired by the Spirit of the living God. Finally, all of you, 
finally all of you. Finally all of you. All of us. Be of one mind. Having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be, what's the next word there? Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. He teaches us to be tenderhearted. Part of being tenderhearted is being forgiving. See, unforgiveness is a symptom of a hardened heart. Forgiveness is a symptom of of a soft heart. Tender-hearted people are forgiven, but they're also forgiving. Would you bow your heads together with me as we pray? Father, we thank you for your word today. We're grateful that you're speaking to us. Lord, we want our conscience to be properly programmed by the truth of your word, by the working of your spirit. We don't want to take our cues from the world around us. We want you to be the, the authority of our lives, and we want to respond in a tender way to your word that when we step off the path, that there's a a proper warning light that goes off in our lives that says, be careful. And when we've erred from where we need to be in our lives, that we come back to you as David did because of a tender conscience and a responsiveness to you. And then, Lord, help us to appreciate and value your tremendous love that you receive us back, the mercy and grace that you extend to us. And then, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be tender-hearted to one another. Lord, so often we get hardened toward people and hardened toward a husband or a wife or a child or a fellow worker or neighbor, someone in the neighborhood. We, get, we let hardness get into our souls. And Lord, that grieves you because you want our hearts to be soft and tender. Lord, wash that away today. Heal us on the inside. Cleanse us on the inside. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to ask no one be looking around or moving about for the next few moments. Very quiet, very still. I never conclude a service without providing this moment. There are people in this room right now and those that are watching online. Some of you, you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never taken that step toward God. And He's calling you right now. That, That thing happening inside of you, that's the Holy Spirit working on you right now. That little uncomfortable feeling you have. That's God saying, hey, I want you in a relationship with me. And the right response when God's dealing with you is to say yes. Don't push him away. Don't say, hey, maybe another time. No, today is your day. This is your moment. You're not here by accident today. You're here on divine appointment today. And Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. And he's saying, I want to come into your life. Will you let me in? And you can do it right now. How? By praying a simple prayer. I'm going to actually give you the prayer to pray. You don't have to say it out loud. You can just whisper it. The key is not how you say it. The key is that you're sincere when you say it. And if you'll pray this this prayer sincerely with me, Jesus will come into your life right now. Pray with me right where you are. Say, Jesus, whisper his name. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for everything I've done wrong. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're God's son. I believe you're the Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you're alive. Just go ahead and tell them that I believe in you, Jesus. Now, here you go. Whisper this prayer from your heart. Jesus, come into my life right now. Ask him and say, come into my life. Forgive me for all of my sins. Today, I turn my life over to you. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for each person that just prayed that prayer. Thank you for hearing them. And Father, I pray you'll help them now to grow in you, follow you, serve you. From this day forward, for your glory and honor, we thank you for it again in your precious name. Amen. Can we welcome some people to God's family today? Fantastic. I know that there are people today that prayed that prayer with me right here in this room. Some of you are watching online. You prayed that prayer today. Uh, if you prayed with me just then, we want to give you a gift. And it's really easy to get. We're not here to embarrass you. We're just here to help you. 
And so if you prayed a prayer today with me to receive Jesus in your life, you'll notice there are people literally around the worship center holding up this, this little book. It's called A New You. It's our gift to you. We want to give it to you. Of course, you got to get it. So the way you'll get it is by walking up to one of these people that has, has it in their hand. And the aisleways here walk up and say, hey, I prayed with the pastor. They'll give you a copy of that gift. And you can take it home to you, help you get started in your relationship with Jesus. I would ask you if you would do one more thing. If you get a copy of that book, I'd love the chance to meet you. I'd love to say hi to you at the end of the service. I'd love to know about the fact that you prayed with me that prayer today. And so at the end of the service, you can head, once you get your book, head right over to meet and greet some wonderful people right over here to my right that would love to say hi to you. And I'm going to be over there in about five minutes. So give me about five or six minutes. I'll be in there with you to say hi to you and uh, to get a chance to meet you. So I'd love to do that. Also, if this is your first time with us today, I want to meet you as well. And our team wants to meet you. And so as soon as the service is over, head right over to meet and greet. They have a gift for you as well right over there. Thank you for being at church. Aren't you glad you came to church today? I'm glad you were here. Why don't you stand to your feet as we get ready to head into a brand new week. Now may the Lord God Almighty bless you and keep you. May he strengthen you through the power of his Holy Spirit. May you walk this week in the confident assurance that your God loves you and his favor rests upon you. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Amen.